What is the World Wide Web? It's our ability to trade information with each other all over the planet. The bacteria had DNA, which we know to be the information program in biological species, and they could trade snippets of DNA with each other across their own cell walls all over the world. To this day, any bacterium can trade DNA with any other, so you can't even speciate them. They change so quickly. So this was a worldwide information exchange system, huh. wasn't it? <laughs> and I call it the first World Wide Web. At the same time, an, in crises, they were developing technologies, even the bacterial motor made of more than 40 proteins with rotors and statters and, and ball bearings and everything, rotating 15,000 times a second, uh, driving high-tech bacteria to invade others. And, you know, it, it was a fascinating world, and they discovered cooperation. They discovered that through a division of labor among these creatively different kinds of bacteria, they could form a community which eventually became the only other cell to evolve on Earth, the kind you and I are made of. They are so complex, they still have the descendants of these ancient bacteria in them, um, and that was, a, that was the biggest leap in evolution. So we have two kinds of cells, and the Earth itself is like a giant cell within which these other cells form. Then those new big cells went through another billion years of feisty competition until they discovered the advantages of building multi-celled creatures. So that was the second big leap in evolution. Now here we are humans, and we're going through the same process of maturing from feisty competition into mature collaboration in building our world economy, in building our internet, in building all of these things that have globalized us. Now we have the choice. Do we continue fighting each other as separate nation states, or do we harmonize, cooperate, and face the great crisis of our time as a global family? And I think the, the interesting thing is you were telling me earlier that we're at the juvenile stage as human beings, and so that we're still fighting each other and in competition and there needs to be a maturity happen to us, like has happened to more primitive life forms beforehand. It's exactly that, except that we're a little further along because we are at one and the same time now in our juvenile mode and our uh, mature mode. Just as you see with adolescents, you know, sometimes they're very wonderful and cooperative, and other times they're feisty and know-it-all and, and uh, want to go out and fight, right? So we're right at that wonderful adolescent stage um, as a global economy. Now, many indigenous people matured long ago. They went through the whole cycle earlier. But our technological civilization had to go through its own feisty adolescence and is just moving into the cooperative mode, which you can see in many ways around the planet. You can see, for instance, over a million NGOs that are trying to make a better world at grassroots levels, many of them, to do microfinance for women's economies, to clean rivers, to do all these things. That's a mature mode operation. And it's the largest movement on the planet today, and it doesn't get into the newspapers very much because mm. it has no central authority. It isn't making a lot of money. It's not newsworthy. But when you add it up, it's a huge, huge bit of pr piece of progress toward our mature phase. What fascinates me is that if you look back on the living, on the living creatures and beings, that were making these very intelligent decisions was they didn't actually have brains as such, did they? We have brains, we work things out, we make decisions, and we take actions from that. So how did that actually work in terms of mechanics? How did they come to this stage where they, how did they make these decisions? Well, this, this is the interesting thing about Western science and a great paradigm shift that's going on uh, at this very present time where um, it's one of my favorite things to talk about is the very foundations of science. Whether you see nature intelligently or not, whether you see nature as conscious or not, depends on your scientific worldview. Now, Western science 
had to be built on certain cultural beliefs about what is the earth, what is the universe, what kind of a universe do we live in. You can't make a scientific theory without having some notion of what kind of a universe you live in. And that depends on a cultural belief. So in Vedic science, for instance, in India, they did thousands of years of study of the mind because their fundamental belief about the universe was that it begins in cosmic consciousness and that matter arises within consciousness. Western science had completely opposite belief that consciousness is a late emergent property of a material universe. Okay. That the, mater the universe is an accidental Big Bang affair and that eventually through gradual evolution that happens more or less accidents all along the way, eventually consciousness arises from our nervous systems, right? So you have a sort of consciousness last in evolution and mm -hmm. a consciousness right. first. On either assumption, you can make theories and test them and build a science. And most people aren't aware of this. They think science is science. In fact, sometimes I talk about the living universe and then a scientist comes up to me and says, well, I loved your poetic metaphors, but this isn't really science, is it? Wink, wink, you know? And I say, interesting, why do you say that? They say, because you can't prove it. I say, prove what? Prove this is a living universe. I say, oh, interesting, how did you prove that this was a non-living universe? And then they look at you funny and say, you don't have to. I say, why is that? Because it's obvious. I said, well, it's not obvious to all human cultures. <laughs> that's because they're pre-scientific, you see, and that's yeah. the end of their argument. Uh -huh. So I puzzled about this a long time, that Western scientists had forgotten that their science rests on cultural assumptions. And rather than wanting to replace Western science, I've become interested in why can't we revive, say, the Vedic kind of science? or build a whole science on the foundational belief that this is a living universe rather than that this is a non-living universe. Neither is provable, but both of them generate theories that may be fruitful for certain purposes, and that's what we want to get at. Western science's purpose was to control nature, to build technology, and it's very good at that. But now some of that technology, like genetic engineering, for instance, is questionable on whether it's good for life. And when you have all machine metaphors in biology, you don't ever get to really understand life as intelligent from the get-go. With the other set of assumptions, you do. You see life as intelligent from the very first bacterium. Mm -hmm. And so you can talk about them as learning in, in the course of as having experience, as having perception, as having intelligence so that they can make discriminations in nature. And it's a very different view of evolution than when you have to describe everything as though it's mechanical accident. See mm. what I mean? <laughs> yes, and of mm. course, what we, I think we have great difficulty as a human race is accepting that we are part of something bigger. Yes. We think we're the superior race, we're the boss of the planet, mm -hmm. we make the decisions, we use the resources as we see mm -hmm. fit. And of course that's taking us on a very dangerous path. Whereas an intelligent viewpoint would be, okay, we may be the superior race in one way, but in another way we need everything else. Mm -hmm. We need the planet to survive, we need the resources to be there. Otherwise, there, yes. won't be a, there won't be a planet that will support us. The planet will be okay, but it won't support us anymore. Right. 